they do. We feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Eulan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. You get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today I'm with Sean Kapner, a postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth, a researcher, writer, and scholar on the history of money and religion. Question mark. I mean, your your niche is kind of specific. So, yeah, yeah. No, I I I'm, I'm I follow a problem where it leads, and the, the problem with following a problem where it leads is it leads you right outside of uh, um, <laughs> easily kind of named disciplinary boundaries. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. so my, my background is kind of in um, history of theology and um, uh, history of philosophy, um, and I'm I'm really interested in, in kind of so, so probably the least bad point of identification would be what's often called political theology. I'm interested in theology not because I, I care about what God really is or something, but because I care about the way in which we're still kind of finding ourselves enmeshed in theological structures um, when we talk about things like money, race, debt. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at. So, so medieval theology, uh, modern economy, and race. So my own background is I have a, uh, a background in literature and anthropology, um, and then because I decided I was going to study law background in uh, um, analytic philosophy. Yeah. Uh, but because I was in literature, I also had to follow continental philosophy, which just led to a lot of internal debates. Um, reason why that's relevant though to our discussion today is that I came through studying history and anthropology to believe that race had a Christianity shaped hole in it. Um, and that the development of our notions of whiteness and blackness are related to different religious groups competing in uh, the 12th, 13th, and 14th century. Um, and that particularly after the fall of, uh, of Constantinople, you had this idea of Europeanness and the Portuguese bring in whiteness to justify continuing the slave trade once they start trading and potential Christians. Um, but I had not thought about it in the context of money until recently. So while, of course, slavery and money should definitely be linked together, prim primarily, um, the, I the idea of the monetary question in this didn't really come to my mind until I started reading some theoretical constructs by mo uh, modern monetary theorists who um, have some very particular readings uh, the biggest one blaming, basically blaming the Franciscans for everything bad that ever happened. Um, they don't really do that, actually, and I think it's mostly a, a metaphor. But the thing is, there's a an ambiguity in the way they talk about this conceptually is whether or not they think it is a historical reality or as it's like a trace concept analog. And your work was pointed out to me by uh, Colin Drum. And when I was looking over your the first chapter of your dissertation and your dissertation like abstract, I realized that yeah. it touched on about five different things I was interested in. So um, I guess the, the con let's talk about the context of your work. Now, you, you your dissertation kind of focuses in on debates around money and debt. Uh, and usury in particular, um, and what uh, medieval Paris? Yeah. Uh, so, 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 kind of these debates that stand around uh, sort of the the what I what I call the intellectual milieu of the University of Paris. So, mm -hmm. a lot of it is is explicit university writings, but there's this kind of um, sort of 
social and intellectual world that revolved around the University of Paris, where not everything is happening in kind of the walls of the university, but the same people are, are kind of get involved in these discussions just outside its wall. So, so sort of early figures in the University of Paris. So, so okay, so for, for those of you familiar with, uh, Michel Foucault has this whole thing about uh, the rise of pastoral power. Like, like the rise of confession being this kind of watershed moment in um, uh, kind of European characterizations of, of kind of what power can do. Um, and a lot of the same guys who are involved in those confessional reforms are also kind of revolving around this University of Paris usury discussion. Uh, and they're going out and kind of promoting these ideas about usury in the context of kind of the 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 kind of preaching tours that that would kind of instill this sort of new model of confession. So there's, there's this weird thing happening in and around Paris right at this time. And usury is weirdly at the center of it, um, which is not something Foucault really touches on, um, but it is kind of this interesting, this interesting link between power and money that, that often gets backgrounded when you think of it just as this, this kind of confessional power thing. Hmm. So why, I guess this becomes clearest when you focus on usury, because that's where the, the, the canon law is going to be the most explicit. But it, it does seem like a key point to your work, because there's a major shift in the 12th and 13th century, right? Um, right. So let's talk about what's the background of usury for the people who don't know. I, I think I think it's actually confused um, uh, by a lot of maybe even stereotypical notions about like why European princes use Jews for bank lending or something. Right, um, right. Um, yeah. So so usury for those of you you know who don't know. Um, Often the way people describe it is it's it's just the prohibition on either lending an interest or lending at exorbitant interest. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't quite technically right in the legal sense because uh, you don't really have a period without interest-based credit um, in kind of European commercial history. Um, so so the trick is how do you so. Uh, a, a bet, maybe a better technical way to, so, so the good non-technical way to think about it is interest. Interest is this thing that's kind of forbidden by Deuteronomy. You're not supposed to take more than you loan. Um, you're not supposed to take more than the principal in return for a loan. Um, maybe the, the more technical way it's often defined um, as this debate emerges around it um, is kind of pricing money, giving money a price in terms of itself that is other than itself. In other words, uh, wanting s the idea of a price of money is, is part of what the problem is. The, the idea that you could price a money in terms of itself and not get inequality, this is, this is um, in some sense, one of the problems this is revolving around. But it's a social problem because uh, what happens um, when you lend money in most societies, not ours. Um, and the not ours is a, a kind of key point here. Well, um, what, happen what happens is when you can't pay them back, uh, you become a pawn. Um, your body is, is kind of the backstop of collateral. Um, so there's, there's a whole problem around, uh, there's a whole kind of social problem around freedom that gets kind of transmuted into a problem of discussing um, what's at stake in lending. And, and one of the things that kind of pops up in the 12th and 13th centuries is that while you kind of have this long history of, of um, kind of Christian suspicion around usury before that, and it's a suspicion that Christians, Muslims, and Jews all kind of agree on, what you don't have is, is a kind of agreed upon definition of what counts. Mm -hmm. uh, when in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, depending on how you look at it, there's like a whole debate about exactly what the big kind of, the, the, the old terminology for this is, is you get what's called the commercial revolution, right? Like this giant uptick in uh, kind of long distance Mediterranean trade in areas that had previously not been open to long distance Mediterranean trade. Uh, 
which requires long distance financial instruments. So like the mercantile shift or whatever. Right, right. Um, Historiographically pre-capitalism question mark. <laughs> <laughs> like, ask, yeah, you know, yeah, it depends on how you define birth capitalism. Birth yeah. Or uh, <laughs> you either call it the birth pangs of a capitalism that fails to get off the ground, or mm -hmm. you call it something other than capitalism, depending on what you think capitalism is, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're the Benyangi kind of side, then this is this is a this is a kind of birth pang of something that doesn't right. quite. Yeah, the, although Ben Benyangi. Uh, has about 50 birth pangs of capitalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but so you have this problem of, of suddenly you've got these new contracts and suddenly, uh, and it matters to the lawyers and suddenly, and suddenly it matters what usury is. Um, mm. Because suddenly it matters whether these contracts are usury or not. Um, and it matters to the lawyers and the theologians in different ways, um, right? Because for the theologians, all or for the lawyers, all that matters is 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 kind of what isn't usury. As long as you can kind of like make show how a few kind of contracts are safe, you're you're not in a, a kind of salvation problem. Um, but for the theologians, this kind of lawyerly problem of like how is it that the the kind of contracts we're doing um, to kind of create these long distance uh, sort of financial mechanisms aren't usury. Uh, raises this question of, okay, but then what is usury? And suddenly everyone's thrown for a loop. Um, mm. And so uh, so I, I kind of specialize in, in the Christian side of this debate, but in part because I, I think there's something interesting and symptomatic for our times about what happens in the, in the Christian side of this debate. So one of the interesting things about this to me is if I look at the work of Colin Drum, which focuses more on England, but... Um, having seen good portions of his dissertation i i do know that he also thinks there's a you know there's some serious transformation going on in this time period but this is this interestingly is a time period uh or just before the time period where a lot of the modern monetary theorists place the beginnings of the like I guess juridical or canon law origins of capitalism in the Franciscan definition of poverty, right? Um, which also comes up in this time period and plays key. I mean, like in some ways, I think it literally plays key roles in either bourgeois or proto bourgeois revolutions because it, the, the you know the importance on things like Savonarola. But in another way, I, I've also found that way too simplistic of an analysis of the origins of of capital and theology so what let, let's uh reframe this a little bit though what is the immediate effect of these debates because the, it is not clear i think to the average person how a debate over usury um in medieval paris would affect both our mod our modern notion of money and our modern notion of race. Right. Um, so, uh, so, what's at stake? <laughs> yeah. So, for what's at stake for me is, is kind of um, th there's a way in which I'm interested in the 13th century in in a weird way, almost as a kind of a dead end that set tells us something interesting about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, like, like the fact that it, it that this debate kind of hits a dead end. Um, says something interesting to us about the fact that we, we sort of can't think what they thought. Um, so the way I kind of got in, came to this is backwards in a, in a certain sense, rather than kind of being first interested in this medieval stuff and then kind of, you know, figuring out, oh, actually there's a lot to say about us here. Um, I got interested in it because this the specific medieval episode I'm interested in kind of kept getting brought up almost like a meme um, in, in kind of debates about debt, especially in the Marxist tradition after mm -hmm. Occupy and, and during Occupy. Um, so, so right in the, in the immediate aftermath of 2008, of course you have all these social movements like Occupy. I was, I was um, fairly involved in uh, Los Angeles um, that, are, that are really kind of centered around debt as, as a kind of primary so yeah. the antagonism. The, the Graeber book comes out at this time period. Yeah, yeah. Bam. Maserato yeah. comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Allier's book, Capital Times, is, is earlier, but mm -hmm. uh, but it is it sort of sets the stage for a lot of the way some of these guys are thinking about it. 
Um, so you, you have all this, like, oh, oh no, we, need, we, need, we really need to think about debt um, as, as kind of its own sort of power relation. Um, and what happens um, is that people kind of start saying, oh, well, there was a critique of debt in the Western tradition. It was the critique of usury. Like, maybe we should resuscitate something about that. We can't resuscitate mm -hmm. the whole thing because it's, it's, you know, kind of relies on these Christian terms that we can't bring back. But there's something right about this, this kind of, like, there's this kind of oh, sort of nostalgic sense that you'll find in, like, someone like Lazzarato, especially, that, like, these medievals understood something about, like, just how kind of fundamental the, the debtor-creditor relationship really is. Um, and they, because they understood it, they, they knew enough to kind of curtail it. Um, so I got interested in, in that nostalgia, um, it, as, in, in part because I also, as someone who was around for Occupy, kind of came to feel like there's a, a sort of, that, that Occupy's, there's something necessary about Occupy's failures, something not purely, like, something that if you just ran it twice, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't succeed the second time. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of us around Occupy, I, th I think one of the really visible failures around Occupy was around questions of racial antagonism. Uh, the idea that debt is a, is a, is a kind of race antagonism. We, we, we kind of, we, it's, it's become very obvious that debt is experienced uh, differently as an antagonism across black and non-black lines. Like the subprime mortgage crisis is a, is a racial crisis. It's not just mm -hmm. a kind of race and agnostic economic crisis. Um, but it's very hard to think about that as a matter of structural position, right? It's easy to think about that as a matter of like a diff, like a matter of prejudice on the part of creditors. Um, harder to think about how race affect, is a matter of like uh, an economic structural difference. Um, so all this kind of comes together for me in the usury question because there's this, uh, episode that keeps getting repeated in these sort of nostalgic Marxist takes on usury, which is this idea that one of the solutions that medieval writers come up with to kind of solve this question of like, what is usury really, if none of us know what counts, is that, okay, what's wrong with usury? Well, if you're a creditor lending money and taking interest, what are you selling? Because you got to be selling something. Okay, you're selling time. You're selling the difference between money now and money later. Um, mm -hmm. But time belongs to God, so you can't buy or sell it. Um, and, and what I kept finding is the Marxists like had this really kind of just so story about this. It, it's, it's like a little thing that they like to trot out and go like, see, they knew it's about time too, um, because uh, the, the kind of modern, like one of the things that links kind of Marxist thought to other kind of, let's call them modern monetary theories or modern forms of, of kind of theorizing economy is, is this kind of linked notion that time is money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy for us to think in, in these terms. It's very easy for us to think of like, what is a wage? It's, it's, it's selling my time or to an employer for a period. What is credit? It's a, it's a price of money now rather than money later. It's a, it's a price on time. Um, and so there's the sense in which you can kind of look at this medieval stuff and say, see that it's like confirming um, what you think is going on um, already. Um, and I kind of looked at these, this medieval stuff and go, no, what, what's happening here is way weirder <laughs> um, than you think uh, is happening. In part because the, the kind of story that will get told about this stuff is that what's going on is, is that kind of the, well, what these medieval theologians are seeing is something like this kind of rise of commercial capital and they're going, oh no, this is like a, a rise of merchant power over church power and we need to like keep time for the church. Um, mm -hmm. The merchant is, is kind of buying and selling time and, and that's, that's our thing, we need to keep it to us. Which would make a lot of sense if what these medieval writers were doing was saying it's wrong to sell time. Um, but the whole thing is that they think it's impossible um, and that, I think, is, is harder for us to get our heads around. Um, the, the idea that it's not that you shouldn't sell your time for a wage. It's not that you shouldn't sell, uh, sell money at credit. 
it's that you in some sense literally can't sell time. Um, and so, so what the user is doing is lying. Um, in a certain sense. He's selling you something he doesn't have. Um, so this creates a, a, whole, a whole kind of weird thing because then you have to figure out well, like, what the hell do they mean by that? Like, like what, why is this impossible for them? Um, and, and kind of the place you get is that they sort of think, and this kind of leads on a, a whole rabbit hole um, that we could unpack if we want, but it, it's kind of a lot to unpack through kind of medieval thinking leading up to the Franciscans, because it, it is a, Franc a good Franciscan who clarifies this. Mm -hmm. um, when he rejects this idea that you can't sell time and says, no, we sell time all the time. Um, but what he means by that, and this is, this is Peter Levy, who's, who's also kind of one of the, the villains in, in the kind of MMT mm -hmm. Franciscan story. What he means is, is that we rent things. Um, so Peter Levy doesn't think a wage could be a matter of selling time. And he doesn't think credit could be a matter of selling time. But he thinks we sell time all the time because we rent out animals. Um, and he uses this interesting passage um, where he's basically finding and replacing uh, like, like almost like a word doc cases from uh, Justini the Justinian code around slavery and just slotting in things other than slaves to think about what's going on. Okay, now that's interesting. So, uh, so he yeah. goes, yeah, yeah, you can sell something's time. You can sell something's time if you own it. And this is important because because the kind of common thread in all this medieval thinking about time, and I, I think this is what makes the medievals different from us in this time question, and it gets to this question of how it is that they're a kind of lens for thinking about, for beginning to think about what has to be different to be us. Um, like how it is that our world has to be different from their world. Um, is that it's not a matter of the fact that, uh, it, it's a matter of the fact that time for them it just is something's existence. Your perseverance in being may, might be a way to put it. You are your time. So there's no way you could sell your time without selling you. Um, now you can sell something's time, that's called slavery or, or, or rent or um, leasing. Um, but this means that, that like one of the th interesting shifts that has to happen and this, this kind of sends you on a rabbit hole of having to look for where this happens is if you wanna talk about kind of the modern uh, modern economy is a way of thinking about time as money and as a way about of various ways of putting a price on time, then you can't mm -hmm. just look at like, how does time become something you can cut up and parcel, right? Like the, the kind of classic, like uh, post stone story is, is like, you know, things like, you get this from E.B. Thompson, but like things, the, you, the time becomes abstract. You can start thinking of it as number, you can cut it up. And this, this all ties to labor discipline, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to even get there, to think of that as a time issue, you first have to think of time as something I can sell without selling me. Um, in other words, I, I have to think of my time as in some sense alienated. Um, and there has to be a practical reality that corresponds to that. Um, and so the question becomes, what is the practical reality that corresponds to that? And that is, I think, where the race question really comes in um, and where you can start to think about this start to think about this as a structural question around race and not just a prejudice question around race. Um, because what is, so so going back to our, our kind of, and sorry if this is like a long kind of rambly um, rant, but so 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 if, if kind of part of the problem with usury is that usury always puts me in a proximity to unfreedom in, in, in kind of pre-modern societies, right? I can, I'm always potentially on the hook um, for my debts. Um, one of the main ways I can become a slave in, in, in most, um, most pre-modern societies is, is by taking on debts that I can't repay. Well, one of the things that cuts that link um, is the racialization of slavery. Um, well, one of the things that kind of makes a hard line between indenture and slavery is when slavery becomes a question of blackness. Um, mm. And so... So when we kind of, so if we kind of go back and we want to kind of retell this Marxist story about like what's different about our relationship to time, um, such that something like abstract labor can make sense to us, 
world. It can't just be a question, I think, of like time becoming fungible. Like it can't just be a question of time becoming this thing that I can quantify and divide up and use to discipline labor. You have to ask this question of how does time become something, how does my ability to sell my time become a mark of my freedom? Um, even even if in this kind of sarcastic, you know, sense. It's, it's like like severance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like, um, like in some sense, severance kind of dramatizes this as, 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 as the kind of like uh, my freedom in my subjection. Like, like I can, I can sort of separate myself from myself and sell part of myself, but that's in some sense, a source of freedom for the me that can sell me. Um, so there's this weird sense in which you have to ask how that comes about. And I think that's a very historically kind of post Atlantic slavery problem. So to circle back around uh, to this, to uh, the question we started with, which is, okay, why do we care about the medievals then? We care about the medievals because they can't think any of this. And their inability to think this is not like a, a failure on their part or something. Uh, their inability to think this is actually set, tells us something interesting about what has to change in order to not be living in their world. Um, and so to me, that's that more than I like, I'm, I'm always more interested in the, the kind of like, how are we different than the past question than how does the past persist question? Um, and then maybe that's a, a very roundabout way of getting to it. Sorry, that's. No, no, it's fine. And my, my audience is used to long and rambly, but the there's, there's a lot of key questions in there for me because I, I have been obsessed with late antiquity and I'm obsessed with uh, early modern, late medieval, Renaissance, whatever you want to call it, like the, like the venture into the historiographic debates over what we name yeah, the the 13th through the 15th century is, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, a whole different show, honestly. But the, it, it seems interesting to me that all these problems emerge at the same time and that in their initial instantiation, they are almost the one to one reading you know, and I say this as a Marxist, but as, as the one-to-one -one reading that Marxists often have that seems to put modern notions into, for lack of a better word, antique brains, always, yeah. always actually doesn't even make sense to me from the Marxist standpoint, because I'm like, if you believe the material conditions are driving this and you think the material conditions are are manifested in whatever um and i wouldn't even say like super structural concerns because actually a lot of the legal concerns that come up in uh in in the 12th 13th 14th century are are would even affect relations of production in a way you can't like bracket right. them out like exactly. yeah that they're not super structural they are also part of the quote base or not of society yeah and one of the things that's interesting about this time period is, you know, I mean, if you, you want to get into like the Frankfurt School reading of uh, of this or whatever, you have this increasing abstract abstractification of time. And then concurrent with the development of slavery, and I think, you know, I have my criticism of uh, Dominique Lasordo, I have strong criticism of Dominique Lasordo, but uh, his, his sort of pointing out that like, modern chattel slavery is itself um, both a justification for, but a driver of a lot of the developments that we see in liberalism, including the idea of self-ownership. Because, oh, yeah. um, And what I find interesting is like, you're almost finding a pinpoint for when that transition begins. So in one sense, some of this like Franciscans represent a major shift in, in the entire debate around money is true. But in another sense, it's not in the clear one-to-one. -one. They they invented poverty, just defining what non-poverty was. Thus, we had, uh, uh, which is you know a slight simplification of Ferguson's argument. Um, but well, there's, there's also this way in which what's interesting about the Franciscans is, is like they're the 
So, so, so the whole th interesting thing about the social milieu of these friars is that, like, the one of the differences between friars and monks is that we think that friars probably kind of mostly came out of like the commercial class, mm -hmm. right? So, 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 the, so more than kind of your your stereotypical monk, your stereotypical friar, whether Dominican or Franciscan, like, probably actually grew up in some proximity to like merchants. Which, which is like not necessarily the case with your your kind of monks who are probably coming more from the, the nobility. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that Franciscans are probably the ones who are even closest as far as like, like yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of renouncers of that world, but by virtue of having grown up in and renouncing that world, they're the ones who actually kind of know what's happening in it. So like a lot of the interesting thing about their proximity to that vocabulary is that they're... So there's so they're reflecting it as much as inventing it is what you're kind of implying, right? Yeah, and the, like a great example of this is the um, the capital interest distinction, which is which is which is often like like it's a thing. So so Ferguson's big source for a lot of his Franciscan stuff um, is this guy Giacomo Todeschini, um, and Giacomo Todeschini is is kind of famous in medievalist circles for having this um, kind of thesis that there's this kind of distinctively Franciscan school of economics and that Franciscans are kind of the first accidental capitalists. We're all kind of familiar with this story as a result of it kind of medi being mediated through Scott's work. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of one of the linchpins of this for Todeschini's version of the story is that Olivi in the same text that I'm kind of looking at in, in um, the, the book I'm working on um, kind of is, is one of the first scholastic theologians to make a distinction between interest and capital. And he's one of the first ones to use the term capital. Um, as he lays, as he says it though, in the text, he's like, he just, he's very explicit. He's like, oh, and a, like, as, as, as merchants are accustomed to calling it, like, like, like he's pulling, unlike the theologians around him who are kind of like theorizing on the basis of like Aristotle, He's like, mm -hmm. okay, what are, what are the actual contractual terminologies that like uh, the merchants I grew up around are using? And let's analyze that. So in some sense, he's he's almost like the first, like an early anthropologist of finance um, in that way. Like, like he's he's like really kind of like like these vocabulary differences are not vocabulary differences he's inventing. Like they're vocabulary differences he's like noting among the merchants themselves and then it's saying okay well then we have to talk about that hmm so yeah so so instead of the idea that the franciscans are creating this reality that because of their methodologies and because of the social classes in which the the mendicants are pulling from um it means that they are more just trying to in the theological and juristic language reflect the reality of which they were born, um, which makes the causal argument much more complicated because, okay, now we're taking, I mean, this is like the primary critique of Foucault is like Foucault takes literary sources as real, um, yeah. you know, uh, and similarly, it sounds like that might be something like we're working with here, except it's not that the literary sources aren't real. It's just they're not the probably the initial source of the difference. Right. Got it. Um, they're, they're trying to catch up to something that they're seeing happening. Um, and, uh, and the theologians are hilarious because they're like extremely, they're like way behind the lawyers. And then the lawyers are still like way behind what's, what's kind of happening okay. on the ground. That... <laughs> So, so you also have like, there's these layers then of intellectual artifice where it's like, okay, lawyers are behind reality, but they have to codify it faster. And then the theologians are like, oh, uh, there's law stuff. We got to figure this out. And I, I, you know, and for example, um, as you pointed out, le legally, Urshri is going to be defined more what it's not than what it is, which is almost as weird via negativa into what to the definition but then the theologians have to feel like they then have to pin down a positive definition and here we go and this um, is a, and yeah and they, they they feel like they have to do that because they're in some sense kind of the doctors of the soul who are going to have to like treat uh treat the user so they, they have to be able to know where where that sin where like how to find the sin itself in order to root it out um uh, 
in a sense. Um, like they're the one who has to prescribe restitution, for instance, um, since usury is a canon law issue in most jurisdictions rather than a civil law issue. So, so they're, they're the ones who are going to have to say like, okay, what do you actually have to give back and who do you have to give it to? Well, to do that, I have to figure out what the actual moral problem is and who the victim is, um, which is a whole pastoral care question for them. So this ties up a whole lot of things. You have the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you have um, this confessional uh, pastoral care thing that we were talking about with, with Foucault. You have uh, modern notions of money and debt. Um, or the be so call them modern sex is probably an overstatement, but the beginnings of something like modern notions of money and debt. And yet you're also kind of showing me that the epistemological and theological world that they're working from is still fundamentally foreign to us. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's interesting. Like it's, it's before you have clear sense of self ownership or the self ownership of time. Um, and also legally engaging, you know, this is something that I, I know, but I've never really thought about the implications of it before chattel slavery, the liberal implications of engaging in, in debt relations. It's a very easy way to end up as a slave. Yeah. Um, you know, or some kind of indentured servant, like, and so the the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade is going to fundamentally shift the conception, not just with this whole new idea of race, something that you have inklings of in medieval theology, but you don't really have like, you know, I know I know this is this is somewhat controversial. I'm reading a lot more on the late medieval origins of racial ideas, but like they don't have a notion of whiteness like we do and blackness right. is a bit vaguer if there is such a thing etc well, yeah yeah you, you can kind of like point to ways in which there there is a kind of like anti-black kind of tropos developing um but it's 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 very much not it's not schematically tied to slavery in the way it's going to be in in modernity it's tied mm -hmm. to demonology a lot of the time instead which right has its own really interesting there's, there's, I think one of the things I want to pull on for a future project, there's a, there's a really interesting story to tell about how those two things come to find themselves in a knot. Um, because if you look at like something like Anselm of Canterbury's, um, Anselm of Canterbury's Cur Deus Homo, right? Um, it's, it's, it's maybe the most influential kind of book of Latin theology that nobody ever talks about as an influential book of Latin theology. Because it's where we get the kind of like, Jesus died to pay back God for your sins, you know, kind of model of, of yeah, like it's the right? ransom, the ransom theology really doesn't exist until that point. Right. Like, I, where it's, it's like, it's like ransom before that because de the devil, you're a debt slave to the devil and then, and God buys you back out from under the devil. And Anselm right. kind of says, no, 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 no. God is the one you owe. Like, like it's not the devil that you owe. Um, that would be giving the devil too much power. So this is all uh, in one yeah. set of account books in a, in a certain kind of sense. So yeah, so in, in uh, other words, it's a theological instruction to correct the imbalance of power previously given to the devil, but right. it changes. So it's, so it's that God has to pay God's self on our behalf kind of thing. Yeah, which um, makes no sense, but yes. But, but is, is now like the dominant, like that's, mm -hmm. if you ask any like non-Orthodox, not like non-Eastern Orthodox Christian, like what they're thinking, like that's, yeah, it's like the like Catholic, Protestant, whatever. Some version of that is now kind of like the thing, right? Um, and it's interesting because the whole thing is built on a debt metaphor, and it's built on a debt. Or it's the prior prior model, and it's built on a slavery metaphor because the the, the prior model is an explicit debt slavery metaphor metaphor built around usury, as as we were talking about, where like you got into too much debt to the devil, and the devil claimed you, and now God has to buy you out from under your debts. Whereas the kind of Anselmian model is is like, oh no, you're actually a manorial serf, um, which is you know not quite a slave in the in the kind of strict sense, but is definitely not free. Um, and you're a fugitive. You you ran off the plantation, um, uh, and thus you owe God a debt because you owe God your manorial rent that you like ran off from, mm -hmm. and you owe God yourself. Which you stole from God, 
Um, and so this is what Jesus has to pay the debt for on your behalf. Um, Ansel ends up devoting a giant chunk of the book to why it is that like the kind of like creditor scheme that Jesus offers us couldn't be offered to angels. Like why is it that fallen angels stay fallen and like stay demons? Um, and the answer is because they're also like, you know, they also ran off the plantation. Say like they're in the same boat that way. But the difference is just that they're natally alienated and we're not. Um, like they're like they don't have kinship ties and we have kinship ties. So a human could pay on our behalf because we can like inherit debt. Um, and so by entering into the line of humanity, Jesus like enters into the line of people who could, you know, kind of be part of the the kind of kinship line of credit and debt and thus transfer merit to us. But since angels don't have kind of lines of inheritance in that way, nobody can pay for them. Um, which is the Moynihan report. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, um, like, like, like this is like, so there's something, there's some, there's a story to tell, right. About how these ideas about demonology and debt and slaveness somehow get become a knot historically. Like they, they get tied together as, as a kind of modern problem. So, so that's, so how does this start more explicitly tying to race? And then we can go back into like how this starts leading to this idea of the self-ownership of time. And we can, we kind of found a key linchpin person in the Franciscan, but let's break this down a little more. So, um, cause I don't think the, I think the, 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 how race problematizes this is obvious, like, yeah. right, the, um, but it's not quite sure how it, how it codifies it. And then I'm going to ask you, you know, maybe something about like the, you know, cause when we normally think of like blood race, for example, like the, 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 the I think sort of the standard story is the, the Netanyahu story is, um, Muslims and Christians are dispossessed. Uh, I mean, not Muslims, Christians. Muslims and Jews are dispossessed in medieval Spain. Um, they convert in large numbers to Christianity, but the state has kind of a crisis, needs their stuff. Um, so you have this idea of new Christian, which ties instead of just being confessional belief, you now have something essential about being a Muslim or a Jew in your, in your personage kind of, um, and thus you're under special scrutiny. And then combined with the Portuguese slave trade, which happens kind of concurrently, those two historical material developments happen at once and bam, we got whiteness and blackness when we didn't really have it before. Right. Um, uh, and the, the idea of also whiteness being tied to blood becoming a, a, a you know, a key, although it takes like 400 years for it really to be hashed out because Catholics, whether or not they're right, depends on who's talking at any given time, et cetera, and so forth. So you still have this weird confessional element. I mean, you have the weird confessional element well into the 20th century. So it's like, yeah. like 400 years to 500 years of transitioning from, confessional linguistic identities into racial uh, pseudo biological identities. Right. Um, but this part of the narrative like seems to complicate that somehow. How? <laughs> so I think, so I think one of the ways it complicates it and I, I pull, so I, I, I kind of am pulling a lot from two. Um, so on, so, so the race question is, is the, the kind of next, so the, the medieval stuff is kind of the accomplished part of this project. Like, like it's, it's like, half of what I think will be a book project. And mm -hmm. part of the point of the medieval stuff is it goes like, okay, so this is really a problem about self-ownership and the inability to think of self-ownership in these terms. What has to change such that we can think of self-ownership on these terms? I think Atlantic slavery is where we get that. Uh, like it's, it's the thing that seems to step in because it has to be a problem about the relationship between slavery and freedom that has to shift, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the right now kind of, there, the, the, where I'm, what I'm kind of drawing on is I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this kind of uh, in process right now is, is, is kind of 
three main sources. One is there's kind of a, a broad literature on, on kind of the history of um, uh, Atlantic slavery and money um, and kind of what's, what's economically at stake in Atlantic slavery. Um, and the way ideas about what is economically at stake in Atlantic slavery are kind of in the process of changing in that literature. And I think this provides an interesting way into the way this both complicates the race question as it's usually posed, but also the way the race question complicates the economy question. Um, so that's one thing I'm thinking with. And then uh, kind of Afro-pessimist literature and Sylvia Winter, and uh, which normally these are two strands that don't get along, but I'm trying to kind of make something out of <laughs> these two things that don't get along. Um, because what I think, so what I think is interesting that's been happening in a lot of the kind of historiog economic historiographies of Atlantic slavery recently that complicates our picture of this as a matter of identity formation, which is I think the lens through which we tend to think about it. There's mm -hmm. this professional identity formation that gives way to a racial one. And that offers the prototypes for the racial one in some sense, right? Like, like ideas about blood really do kind of come out of ideas about the Eucharist as, as a yeah. kind of mode of relating. Um, there's Christian blood first, and then Christian blood is what becomes white <laughs> blood. Right. Uh, I mean, you have this you alien have, the, yeah. uh, on the part of like the idea that new Christians aren't really Christians in the Iberian Peninsula becomes this important part of uh, differentiating by blood, which then. So I, I think I think that stuff is I, I broadly think that stuff is right. Like I'm really influenced by Gil Anjar, um, okay. who also is it kind of uh, read a big book called Blood. <laughs> Um, it's also kind of uh, drawing on a lot of that same, same literature. Yeah, I mean, but I think blackness complicates this story. Um, okay. I think the thing that Afro pessimists get really right, um, that then needs to be brought into an explicit conversation with literature on economy and material conditions in slavery, um, which often, both to Afro pessimists' credit, because I, I do think this is what, part of what's really powerful about it as a discourse, but also where what, where something new needs to happen, is that they kind of stick at the level of the libidinal, right? Like they're they're very interested in kind of psychic the psychic economy of blackness, and they are interested in it as an economy, like a libidinal economy is the key term for them. But I think something's, I think the thing that Afro pessimism gets really right is this idea that. Blackness sits in a weird relationship to discussions of race because there's ways in which uh, blackness as a problem is not just a racial problem because it's not just a problem of identification or it's not just a problem of, of kind of like, um, like there's, 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 there's something, there's some, so, so the Afro-pessimist line is that blackness is a structural position, not one race among others. Um, but that it's intrinsically tied to race because the, the kind of like the the schema of race doesn't make sense without it. Uh, right. It's the defining negative point, like it's right. the eternal other. I mean, and there, it is interesting to me also as blackness is the category that while it does change um, and is, is also regionally different, but uh, is condemnatory almost in all cases whereas other racial groupings are more fluid like I, I always think about like the early christian writings about china and korea and how they the color metaphor is not there and in fact the initial portuguese and spanish traders refer to them as um white like us which i think blows people's minds when yeah. they first encounter that and and only throughout time do you have this notion of yellowing added on to that and this new racial category, but it's one that's always in flux. Right. Uh, whereas blackness has flux around the edges, but it's the edges. It's like the primary category does not change in the same way. Um, right. Um, and so, so I think what's, what's interesting about this and what's really connectable, um, uh, my friend uh, Tasia McDougal, I think, is doing some of the most interesting for, kind of forthcoming work on this. Um, mm -hmm. So that's someone to look out for. Um, is that this intersects with these historiographies of capitalism and slavery because the, kind of the early version of the capitalism and slavery question is about profits, right? It's about to what extent are, are kind of the profits that get capitalism off the ground driven by the slave trade? And so the the, the kind of uh, 
the economic question with regard to slavery is always going to be in relationship to labor. To what extent? To what extent is the slave an exploited laborer? Is it the most exploited laborer? Um, is it a particularly profitable form of labor exploitation? If it's not, is that why it dies away? You know, right? Yeah, the whole. The, the, I mean, this is fundamentally tied up in the fact that Marxists can't believe uh, Marxists can't agree if like chattel slavery is capitalist or not. Like, right, right. For this reason, I mean, like, because it's yeah. like, wait, it doesn't. By our definition, slaves are fixed capital, but they're kind of not. And then, yeah, uh, it, it's pretty clear that slavery accumulation is a large part of why uh, English, um, you know, industrial capitalism is able to accumulate so much. And that doesn't really fit the model of free competition. Well, shit. Like, I, you know, I, it's the it's the pedestal in the veil, right? Like, it's, right. It's, uh, the slavery is the, is the pedestal required for the um, uh, uh, the veil of, of um, like capitalism to get off the ground. Right. Like, yeah. Um, otherwise, it probably would have just stopped in England and died there. Like, right. Um, um, so, yeah. So the way the way this literature is changing, which I think is really interesting, is kind of noting that, like, uh what's so interesting about kind of the Atlantic slave economy is that slaves aren't just a labor value. They're also money in, in like a really important sense. Um, they're speculative commodities, but they're not just speculative commodities. They, they function a lot like bullion um, in, in certain contexts. So, um, so like if uh, a person to go to on this, although like, I think this book is like, there's a lot of things I really, really don't like about this book. And one of the things I really don't like about this book is, is the kind of good guy, bad guy framing he sets up, which I think is, is totally off. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, is it Michael O'Malley? Um, Face Value is the name of the book. Um, uh, something O'Malley. Um, uh, it's, it's this kind of account of, of kind of the early United States economy which is kind of built around this question of like, okay, why why not something like the Bank of England in the United States? And like, why did slavery take a war in the United States end and not in like the rest Everywhere of- Everywhere else but Brazil. Yeah, like. <laughs> right. Um, uh, and Haiti, but- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and Haiti. Well, I mean, Haiti, Haiti it took a war, but yeah. it was- <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. It's a really early war, so yeah. Um, um, so yeah. So, so, so what, what's what's going on there? And O'Malley's kind of um, the part of O'Malley's thesis that I really buy is this this idea that like, well, the kind of peculiarity of the early United States economy is that there's like not a lot of you you on the one hand, ever nobody wants to do a Bank of England, and everyone's really afraid of doing a Bank of England, and it's like like the whole kind of political culture is like militantly against doing a bank of England. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there literally isn't enough metal to do like a, a fully metal um, kind of base for a currency. Um, yeah, so this is so you have this weird experimental, like small scale, like, you know, kind of loan sharking thing going on as like the right. main way things are running. Um, and O'Malley's argument is that basically, well, like, since you can't, since you, you need something to stabilize, like, uh, price fluctuate, like, you need, you need something to quote prices, in, you need a currency to quote prices in as a reserve currency, even if it's not a payment currency. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't get a central bank doing that, and you also can't have metal serving that role, then, like, what do you got? And his argument is basically slaves serve that role in, like, a lot of the time southern economy it's like the way in which slaves are rehypothecated like if you trace what it's actually doing is it's, it's working like a reserve currency instead of metal um, hmm. um and that that's actually like the kind of fundamental kind of issue the kind of fundamental economic kind of pin happening with slavery there it's not about labor value or at least not just about labor value it's like about like the need for human cap like human capital as a kind of like known quantity <laughs> against which other things float um uh so which, so basically you have to think of slavery 
in modern terms as an investment interest instrument as well as um a form of of productive capacity um, right yeah um, okay that makes sense i mean that that does make sense it makes a lot of sense and that's not that wouldn't even be uniquely modern exactly but right um, um but the way in which it kind of pins the atlantic economy together is is kind of this this interesting weird um problem and the way in which making it possible for it so so like one of the weird things about kind of atlantic chattel slavery is um the way in which it's, it's kind of like a generalization you know like so so the in a lot of ways there's like a lot of different kinds of slavery such that the word slavery is like a really slippery category in most uh i i hate the word pre-modern because it kind of gives this sort of you know teleological whatever like we're all kind of marching here but like let's call let, let's say non-modern societies or something mm -hmm. um like it's a notorious it's notoriously slippery to try to pin down like what is and isn't slavery and is serfdom a kind of slavery or like you know like various other kinds of relationships about freedom are these slaveries yeah i had a whole two-hour episode on early it was just trying to figure out if a serf was a slave when right. the distinction is what especially because it's the same word like legally speaking like, yeah like, it is <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, but the rules seems kind of different but it's yeah. really hard to pin down and the exact I mean, even going into like, even only limiting it to Britain, which is what we were doing. And we we're just like, I don't even know when the laws change. Like, like it's not clear actually right. at all. So, right. yeah. And so one of the things that that's sort of interesting and, and like, you know, fucked up beyond all recognition about uh, Atlantic chattel slavery is that it kind of generalizes a model of slavery uh, where the trade is kind of destined for sale from the beginning. So the, the, the slave is never even fictively incorporated into the household as kind of subservient kid. Um, this, uh, is yeah. this is the interesting um, kind of like, to, so to me, so the, the funny thing, like as an aside about the, the kind of MMT Franciscan story is like, like I, I also think that like the Franciscans are super fucked up. Um, mm. But they're fucked up because like all their legal categories are slave, like all their all their religious categories are legal categories are slavery categories. Like like the way they understand themselves is through Justinian slave law. Like like that's the whole fuck, like that's the whole setup. Um, that to me is like way more. That to me is like the more interesting line to the present than like the radical individualism or something. Um, but so there's this whole thing that happens there where it's like, do, in order to make, in, in order, it, there's a kind of radicalization of slavery that happens with Atlantic chattel slavery. It's, that it's not the same as other, other slaveries. And one of the ways it's not the slave, the same is the way in which this, the slave is kind of absolutely natally alienated instead of relatively natally alienated. The slave isn't just alienated from their original community in order to be incorporated into the, the new household um, as a kind of subordinate part of it. They're, they're not reincorporated. They're like continually kind of like re-disconnected from uh, lines of affiliation by sale. Uh, right. Destined yeah. to be sold and resold. Right. Both uh, both within their own within their own families, but also, I mean, this this distinction is subtle, and it's one that I think people really need to think about. Um, about one of the things that defi it's not just technology that redefines shadow slavery like yeah that's another part of it that makes it shittier actually yeah. but but the other difference is indentured servitude antique slavery the whole pattern familiar system actually that uh the 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 pattern the, the pattern familiar is also the head of the slaves and the slaves are part of the household as ba basically as permanent children unless they are able to buy their freedom Right, exactly. They're, they're literally minors. The, the legal category minor, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it comes from the, the way you describe both children and slaves as kind of household incorporated legal entities. Right. right. And chattel slavery breaks that because at no time are African slaves incorporated into anyone's family as a minor. They are solely a commodity. Right. And traded as such. Right. Um, and that is new. That is, you know, that's almost completely new. 
Um, and so I think this, so I, so I think this tracks onto this question of like, how is this a struck, like a kind of economic structural position and not just a, a kind of prejudicial mindset and not mm -hmm. also not just a kind of question of identification because it becomes a question of the difference between having and being money. Um, which is to say also, which if, if time is money, and this is kind of the thesis, uh, is also a question of the difference between having and, like the, the, the difference between having and being time, like the difference between being able to have your time outside yourself such that you can sell it without thinking that you're selling you versus not being in a position to sell your own time because your time is being always sold out from under you um, corresponds to this difference between having and being money in a certain kind of sense. And so then if you want to pose that question for today, if you want to pose the question of, of kind of how this remains, then I think the question has to become how and where is that distinction between having and being money operative? Um, even if it's kind of diffused and euphemized away. Um, so I, for example, collateralized, collateralized subprime debt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right yeah like that, that is a way in which people are act serving as money for other people um and and so i think it's no accident that it doesn't uh kind of track race blind lines um right right i mean that makes sense i mean like the the there's because there's a direct line here and because it's tied up literally into slavery and 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 then the, some of these financial instruments would through just historical accretion actually still have many of these same kinds of tendencies um right uh, yeah and this is this is why like you know the the perpetual like crocodile to your liberal concern about like the black family is is like is in some sense the perpetuation of natal alienation in that way because because the, the like the question of who can distance themselves from their debts by calling on um like beneficent kin as 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 yeah like, kin like, wealth basically yeah and who can't um mm. like is, is kind of played out no longer at the level of explicit law as it is in in kind of chattel slavery but it, it but it is played out as our cultural discourse around blackness right uh, and, and, and probably even i would not be surprised if people who are studying this like if somebody was to take your research into say um 19th century to early 20th century united states that we would definitely see um that this overlaps with, with uh, wealth disparities, who's, um, you know, even in the category of whites, like which, which peoples have uh, clear ties to inherited wealth probably traces pretty cleanly to who was a wasp or not, like, right, right. Um, you know, so, um, so Hortense Spillers has a line about in, um, uh, which essay is it in? Um, I think it's in, uh, I think it's just in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, um, about like, how, about like the, like certain kinds of kinship claims on the part of, um, this, this is as part of her reading of, of the Moynihan Report as, as, as a kind of persistence of the afterlife of slavery, um, of like the way in which for some people, um, like claims to kinship and inheritance can always be invaded at any moment um, by capital, whereas others get to uh, kind of like supersede and like make claims on capital. Mm -hmm. um, and like this is, I think this is where you want to look for like the way in which it, this is a kind of continuing racial structural position that isn't, uh, isn't just a matter of like, um, like, did we hire enough black people <laughs> at our company, uh, or, or like have enough black superheroes? You know, been represented in Marvel films. Right. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a structural race gap. Uh, race gap that um, 
I mean, I do take some notion, uh, like there's some interesting work that complicates this a little bit about like the comparing of a different group with interracial uh, category and different wealth gaps and class. And I think some of that is important, but I do think at a, at a fundamental basic level that like the wages of whiteness is that you look like the people who have capital, even if you're not one of them. And so, um, and you, you just have all sorts of, of literal privileges that come from this. And I think, you know, it's one of these things where, I mean, you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, E.B. Du Bois is really where, uh, W.B. Du Bois is where I'm really pulling this from. Yeah. And um seems pretty true. And then it maps onto this narrative pretty well, actually, like explaining this big transition. What I find interesting is the kind of, interrelationship between theology and law and legal dynamics yeah and the way that they it's not it's a feedback loop but it's not a simple one there's a very complicated set of feedbacks that are shifting very subtly in the 12th and 13th century and that's interesting and it's also interesting to think about the fact that we can't really go back there like i always yeah like the mental space of, of of people's from a different time period is not something you can ever totally put yourself into. Like you can kind of abstractly understand it. You can paint it out. We can figure it out from micro history and macro history, et cetera. But we don't think that way. Yeah. And, and that's we think that way, not just because we don't have the ideas, but because we don't have the world. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like exactly like, in which that thought is like a, a live thought <laughs> right i mean because these these theological and legal categories are also reinforced in the actual economy of daily life and there's an interface there and right. like i think sometimes marxists are too reductive about that interface but it is there right and so it's almost impossible to fully like fully immerse yourself in that mindset um and, you know, because, like, for the average person, when they read Anselm versus, uh, what, Peter the Chan uh, the, the Cantor, or, uh, Peter the Chanter, et cetera, some of these questions just go right through them because it's not even something we would be picking up as important. So when we read that text, we don't notice it. In the same right. Way. But I think this is what happens, like, like so, so you know, back going back to the kind of, um, that, like, the fact that, like, my kind of way into that medieval stuff was that all these Marxists love this little episode, mm -hmm. like the, the selling the user is selling time episode. Um, they pretty much all get their kind of version of it from one his one medieval historian, Jacques Lagaffe. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole like a lot of the way that gets talked about is is kind of run through a very kind of understandable basic misunderstanding that Jacques Lagaffe makes of those sources. That's like, oh, of course you would make this because, like, you just, it, things just have to be, it, it makes way more sense to us uh, the way he lays it out than the way they, in fact, lay it out. Um, so Lagaf reads the source and he goes, okay, so, so the user, um, like, sells time and the user's a thief in, in this kind of medieval debate. So the user's a thief of time. He steals God's time and he sells it to you. And so the question is about, profaning something sacred like it's it's about the idea that like that uh which sounds really plausible um the idea that this is the time is is this like sacred thing that you're not supposed to touch in this way with money and then and then making it money is is, is the sin um mm. but the problem is that uh and it, it look if you if you read the sources you can see where it gets it because it would read really naturally from a lot of these sources, if you didn't read like the next thing they say kind of thing, or if you didn't read uh, the legal sources they're pulling from to make this point, mm -hmm. but they're actually very explicit that no, no, God is not the person being stolen from because this would be impossible, <laughs> um, which is a very, and that's the part that's hard, I think for us to get our, to even get our concern, like minds and concerns around is, is the, the idea that this wouldn't just be something you shouldn't do, but that this is in some sense, literally unthinkable for them that, that like you couldn't be taking god's time and selling it it's not yours <laughs> you don't have it um so the person you're stealing from is actually the debtor because 
you're offering them something fake and you're taking their money. Mm. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that makes sense though, because like, yeah, they can't sell you your time, so you're taking away money for them for no reason and risking their enslavement, etc., and so forth. Yeah. But, but then you throw that shifting idea in with transatlantic chattel slavery, and the whole thing starts to decouple almost instantly. Right. Um, and then you know, two centuries later, you have John Locke writing about, or three centuries later, you have John Locke writing about self ownership and using it to justify more chattel slavery, et cetera. So like, um, I mean, that's, yeah. you know, um, and well, that's more well understood, I think, but yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's like one of the interesting things that like we read. So, so like this is a move that like, not just Locke makes, like Locke makes it non-sarcastically. Marx mm. makes it kind of sarcastically, like, like, mm. like, like as a, as a kind of characterization of this tradition, uh, Kant makes a version of it, although everyone doesn't, People often miss this in Kant. Um, mm -hmm. Also, like this is like the rest. Like uh, um, this is like running through. Um, like I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a, becoming a weird Benjamin Franklin freak right now because because there's something weirdly symptomatic about the guy. Um, uh, the, this idea that like it's not just that you can sell time because there, there's kind of like. A kind of value in labor time or something but that in some sense the difference between freedom and slavery like like for Locke, marx kant like the difference between labor and slavery one of the main ways you can narrate it is whether your time is sold in part or in whole um mm. uh like this is this is an explicit point um so this, so this is the explicit point of that passage in in the second treatise in Locke, like the like in the in the whole thing where he's talking about how like the slave like uh, has forfeited life and that's like what you know makes the slave slave he like explicitly contrasts this with like and thus like whereas the worker sells their time in part the slave's time is sold in whole lock uh, marx makes almost word for word this point um uh in uh where does he make it again i'm forgetting where um angles makes a version of it in um The uh, um, oh, Marx is Marx says this in uh, chapter six of Capital Volume okay. um, that that uh. If, if uh, the worker were to sell his labor power rump and stump rather than piecemeal, he'd be selling himself, converting himself uh, from a free man to a slave, from the owner of a commodity into a commodity. So, there's, so there's this weird part whole relationship around selling mm -hmm. time that makes a like, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, kind of makes a lot of sense to modern thought. Um, and part of the question is, well, how does that make sense? Because it's not clear that that makes any sense to a medieval. Right. Um, like it's not clear that selling yourself your time in part is a could ever be a mark of freedom for a medieval writer, um, and right. that's that's like the curious thing for us. I think. Like freedom, freedom for a medieval writer is more explicitly. I mean, in some ways, more explicitly a legal category instead of right. these these implicit differences. Um, like it's you're not going to find it in the grammar of contract. You're going to find it in the grammar of like personal status. Right. Yeah, like who? Like you just show up in weird stuff, like some theory laws and yeah. whatever. Like, yeah, um, that's that's a fascinating distinction, though. I mean, because in some ways, it does fit a kind of Marxist model of what makes capital unique. All these things are abstractified and hidden, where in other times they're just like kind of blatantly out in the open. But the other thing that it ties you into is how much. But I really do think people underestimate the importance of these theological justifications because they really do kind of lay down the limits to the way you can think in a society and, right. and they don't emerge from nothing, at least if you're a Marxist, like they, they also reflect society as it actually exists in some way. Um, and so I, I think that's, that was kind of my feeling about the, you know, Scott's popularization of the, of the Franciscan story is I'm like, that feels like, 
too pat to think that the ideological justification is what actually creates the conditions for the material change. It feels like the material change would have already existed somewhere um, are beginning to, or there's some kind of, there's some kind of way in which these things are reflecting each other and slowly shifting, not as, okay, we have this instance, this instance is this fully formized idea that comes down. And then from that to separation, there you go. And I, I just, I don't tend to think concepts work that way. One of the reasons I don't think that is trying to figure out when the hell feudalism started and if it's a thing. Right. Um, <laughs> like, like, you know, it's like, it's like by the time, you have something that you can clearly call feudalism in England and France. It's almost over. Like, right. so, um, uh, yeah, which, you know, as, as a Marxist who initially encountered modes of production as very simple demarcations of economic difference, uh, that kind of shit blows your mind when you first, like, it breaks a lot of Marxist's brain to deal with that. Um, but, yeah, it, it, that makes sense to me. And it also... It also makes sense in why this transition takes a while. Like why, like for me, like pinpointing when does the early modern world begin? And like, it's like, there's a three century development period, basically. I mean, everyone usually talks about the calamitous 14th century, but like the ideas really start in what some people would even consider the high middle ages. And that's when the shift really kind of begins. Um, and the Erschery debate's interesting around that. And it's interesting. It's interesting because your your narrative actually explains why the Jewish and Muslim debates about Ursary do not go this way and also are basically resolved by modern capitalism, not by uh because I mean, you know, I mean, yes, Jews in, uh, technically engaged in what they would consider Ursary, except that uh, in Jewish halakha, like charging an outsider interest is not the same as charging a Jew interest. And so, well, so yeah. And, and also, so, so the, the other interesting thing about the difference, like to get really like kind of schematic and, and like to the point of almost stereotypical about kind of the difference between Muslim, Jewish and Christian debates about this in the middle ages mm -hmm. is uh, the Muslims settle really early on a kind of shared sense that, the issue is really about risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but the issue is, is about proportionate distribution of risk. And this is why like contemporary Islamic banking debates keep going back to medieval Islamic debates uh, about uh, Reba being this question of, of who, who shares what amount of risk and how do you write contracts such that the capital partner isn't shielding themselves mm -hmm. from risk, right? Um, so they, they, they kind of glom on really early to this, this risk kind of frame. Whereas the, the kind of Jewish tradition, again, to be so abstract as to stereotype a very varied discussion, latches on really early to this question of servitude. Like it's very explicitly, like the, the, the kind of ur text is Deuteronomy. It's the, the, so the insider outsider stuff is there, but also you know why you're doing this. It's because like, debt makes slaves um, and over generations that makes classes of slaves and you don't want that. <laughs> um, so you need release valves for that. Mm. Um, and so there's, there's this real sense in which there's the ambiguity of the, the whether the creditor approaches you as a friend or an enemy, um, which, which is, a, which is, you know, like on the, on the one hand, you want to be approached with credit <laughs> um, credits an opportunity but on the other hand, what what happens when you lose, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, so so it's a, there's a fundamental ambiguity built into the relationship that that Jewish thinkers are extremely attentive to, and, and that they're like, no, 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 that's that's the real problem. Like like the real problem is is uh, this thing. Whereas early Christian thinking, like like patristic era, as we might call it, Christian thinking, is really explicit about the servitude aspect. The medieval debate about usury among Christians is like they like don't want to look at the servitude aspect. Like the language is all over it. Like if, if you look at what they're saying, it doesn't make any sense without it. Because the whole thing is like predicated on the idea that like, oh, why is God the only one who could take usury according to the parable of the talents? Well, because God owns you. Like, <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> so, so, so unlike your creditor, God legitimately um, kind of can make a claim on the profits of your time. Uh, 
But so, so this, the slavery question is all over the, the medieval Christian debate, but it's all over it as like this, like, like this thing haunting it that we're all pretending isn't there. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Which is very different than the, like, if you go read uh, rabbinic opinions, it's like explicit what the, yeah, yeah. what it, the it, problem is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's interesting also because you're also kind of, in a way, uh, you're also documenting how post schismatic uh, Orthodox Catholic Christianity, when the Catholic breaks off, uh, really st starts changing categories away from patristic categories. And the patristic categories are an extension of, in many ways, uh, let's say, um, uh, Greek. Greek Judaic thought together, like like semi-Hellenized Jewish thought or something. Like that's that's really what you're seeing in those early patristic writings. It's still a very Jewish worldview in a lot of ways, even when it's not Jews writing. Um, that's not the case by like like showing a Jew. I, I always imagine these medieval debates between rabbis and and uh of which and, there, and, like, there were a lot. There were tons, like <laughs> it was pretty common. Yeah. Um, but I'm like by the 11th century, they're arguing over such different things and their conceptual frameworks have become so divorced from each other on both sides that I'm like, I have no idea what, neither side would even have understood what the other side's debate point was. Like, it, it, it's got, it had to have been weird to watch. But, but yeah, this, but, this is interesting to think about. Yeah, well, so, so I think there's two, like, if you want to think about the history of Christianity and race, um, mm. I think there's, there's two, like, running, like, kind of, whole history of Christianity issues that, that like really you kind of can't get away from. Uh, one is the supersession problem and the way the supersession problem gets racialized as a, as a problem of bloods in the Iberian Peninsula. Right. Right. Um, so one is the fact that it's, it's very hard to think about how you have Chris, a Christian thought that doesn't have to both claim Judaism for itself, but also say that Judaism doesn't get to have itself. Right. Um, that, that in some sense, the whole basic claim is that, like, we're the better Jews, um, even, like, you know, when the Christians aren't being Jews. Uh, and um, haven't been Jews for 500 years. Yeah. No, uh, but, yeah. Um, but, but in some sense, we, we own something of yours more than you own it. Um, like, 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 they're, they're, that's a, I, I don't know. I don't know how you have a non-separate supersessionist Christianity. Like I, I, I've seen people try, but I don't think I've ever seen it to my, to my mind done. And I think that's like a fundamental structural problem with, with the thing, right? Like you, as long as the thing centers around the claim that like the, the Jewish Messiah came, died and the Jews rejected him. Like I don't know how you, like it gets built into the thought structure in like really deep ways beyond just the explicit, explicit supersession, right? Like I think there's a reason Hegel, like there's a reason Hegel's philosophy kind of resembles the theology of supersession. And it's not just that he's like kind of like a German Lutheran at the level of like explicit ideas. It's also something structural about the way Christian means of thinking are taken up. And right. that's part of the race question, I think. But the other part of the race question is the way in which like Christianity is obsessed with the language of slavery from moment one. Like, it's all over Paul, like Paul's whole kind of discourse of like, what is it to be a Christian has to be, has to do with being a, like a slave or an economist, which is a kind of slave of God, right? Mm -hmm. um, being God's kind of minor and representative um, in, in a certain kind of way, while at the same time proclaiming freedom. Right. This we're a slave to God, but we're not a slave to anybody else. And we're a universe. The other, the other interesting thing is the universalization of the ethnoi uh, concept that you see in Christianity. I mean, uh, when a lot of racialists, there's, yeah, yeah, the the fact that they're both neither Jew nor Greek, and neither slave nor free, like the fact that the, this couple right. is the core couple, right, of Christian universalism, is I think that that's symptomatic. <laughs> right, now. it's not. And it's unlike, say, like Muslim univers uh, universalism, which is basically, to put it bluntly, everybody can be an Arab. Um, right. Uh, um, which, which there's like a nice parallel with Haitian, like early Haitian universalism, which is, oh, anybody still here is black. 
Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're all black now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it's it it's it is very the Christian conception of universalization almost particularly when the antique empires fall away um become it's hard to imagine it not becoming racialized given the language that it speaks to i mean like that's the thing that was always been my well you know yeah it's true that european cohesiveness was basically christendom christendom was not racialized really um until probably around the time that we're talking about and definitely completed by the fall of byzantium um but on the other hand, and in a very real sense, you do find the components there um, in a way that you don't find everywhere else. Like you don't like a lot of the building blocks for our modern conception of race, um, decoupling, for example, identity from language is a big one. Um, and also, once you we talk about the specific period that we were talking about, like the idea that the Eucharist and the blood, and there's this blood metaphor, and now we're like thinking about it literally, and then all of a sudden biological racism starts emerging. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, you mix that way of thinking in with scientific thought, and you get something very specific that had not emerged in other societies. Um and I think it's also very hard to, like, when you talk to moderns, it's hard to get people to realize, like, yeah, people were pretty xenophobic, but the idea of it being racialized, even today, like, you go to, you go to like, East Asia today, because I've spent a lot of time there. Um, I lived there for three and a half years in Korea. Uh, the word for Asian is Asian, meaning it's a foreign imported concept. They don't have a contemporary word in Korean that is... That is the same. And their notions of race, while very much tied into blood post uh, 19th century, um, thanks Germans, um, is, is still, it's like, it's not ours. Like, like Koreans, like Koreans talk about themselves as a race and that's it. They're not part of an Asian race. There's not like none of that. Right. Like that might be related to, I mean, they're related to Japanese, but then the, you know, they hate each other. So different thing. And it's, I think a lot of, I think it blows a lot of, um, I know because I've lived there, blows a lot of Westerners minds because they're, they, they automatically come in with like this idea of like, well, you have racial solidarity between Asians because they're Asians. And like, that's not the case. And that concept really exists there. Um, it does exist there now we're in a modern world, but it's not, not, it's, it's still not actually probably the dominant mode of talking about things. Yeah. Um, that to me like is like these leftovers these let's say leftovers again implies the teleology i don't want to imply but it's 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 hard for us as uh, you know to particularly i think in america and in canada um and the settler colonial states in general to conceptualize this because i think we i think one thing that like always baffles uh American racist is they don't understand like why the nationalism thing in Europe always trumps the racial solidarity. Like it just, it, you know, I, I remember this funny little bit where like Richard Spencer is bemoaning the decline of the EU. Like, um, and I think that is partly related to these shifts that you see here. And that's when this happens. Like, right. you know, um, but the, the metaphorical ground, like if you want to, like, you're right. Like, Blackness being tied to demonology, um, that being the primary metaphor, you start seeing that pretty early on in Christianity. Like, yeah. um, it's just not literalized and tied to a biological being explicitly um, and to other humans explicitly till the time period that we're talking about. Um, it kind of is like yeah, you'll it, see it, it thrown it's around. Kind of out of art, there's like, there's, right. there's, a, there's, a, there's like a whole kind of medieval art history argument about how like like moorishness and like demon like demonology kind mm. of like get like in a weird tangle um, yeah but even uh, that's like that's post-islamic like if you go into very early christian you don't see that hard right at all. i mean and it actually it's, it's interesting to think about like when you talk about like 
patristic fathers and I've even heard black Christian, like black Christians talk about them as part of white Christianity. And I'm like, they were Arab and African like, yeah. for the most part. Like, like you're dealing with like uh, Cyrene, which is Libya, like Egypt, um, Ethiopia, uh, you Alexandria, know, yeah. Alexandria. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, uh yeah i mean th th some of them might have been pale skinned out i mean egypt's been pretty diverse forever but like uh i i don't think it meant what you think it means <laughs> like but but again it's because we have we're so removed from that world that we can't think about it even even late medieval christianity has trouble thinking about it in a way that would portray these people as they actually were oh, yeah. so um, and actually, it would be even harder because they don't have any conception of like, like everything. Everything's always presented contemporaneously in medieval art. Yeah. So. Um, um, uh, yeah. No, it's 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 weird. Um, that's something I was going to say, but it just. Oh yeah. Never... Sorry. <laughs> so, but this ties in the this idea. Like when I think about like people as money, money as being a commodity, but the abstraction away from say, you know, gold, the, the particularly when you tie it in, I mean, into later stuff, like when you were talking about the other scholar, I forget the name. You uh, Matt Lee. Uh, Matt Lee. Yeah. Cause I'm like, Oh, well that explains like all the stuff that uh, Kristen Dazen is like, seeing in colonial america <laughs> like all of a sudden because oh yeah there's not enough bullion they're having to experiment you come up with these fiat currencies there's also all these loan sharks everywhere like how do you deal with that well you know this that taxation destroying money etc legal categories come back into the play you know there you go and you have something like a modern uh, modern money system but seeing that there is actually some kind of continuity and tension going back, but it's not one-to-one. -one. Like, that's the other thing. It's not right. like... Um, and I think Colin does a good job of illustrating that, like, um, it was also mostly about bullion prior to the 13th century. It wasn't all about that, um, but there were other debt and credit instruments, but it was a lot about it. Um, so, yeah, thank you. This has actually been kind of uh bracing what what else would you like to like i know that you tie in contemporary theorists in your at least what i've read of your perspectives for your dissertation um which contemporary theorists did you find most helpful applying to this stuff well so the funny thing is i have like a weird i have a weird because because i think that the way people often when they do this kind of thing engage contemporary theory is they go like oh what contemporary theorist helps me explain this thing um, mm -hmm. and I, I kind of have this weird, my, the, the, I kind of have this weird mashup method where like, I'm trying to like break out of the bot, like break out of the, the kind of like binds, uh, I'm trying to like figure out what medieval writers are trying to think through, but can't say by mashing them up against a more contemporary. Right, so there's a point of contrast. Also trying to figure out what minute. more contemporary theorists can't say. <laughs> All right. I'm like trying to use them both to get a third thing. Um, so the the way it kind of lays out, because I, I kind of think that this user of the sale of time argument develops in sort of like three steps. Like there's the first guys who come up with it and they mean something specific by it. There's this weird phase where people are trying to like talk about this kind of Aristotelian dynamic and that leads to a whole other thing. And then there's the third phase where it gets rejected by Peter Levy, the Franciscan, but that kind of signals what people were talking about the whole time in retrospect in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find Derrida really helpful for that first bit because Derrida's reflections in a uh, given time um, on giving and taking time and kind of the status of time and gift track really well with the gift categories that medieval thinkers are trying to use for this. But Derrida kind of gets into this whole kind of impossibility of the gift kind of paradox because he's at I think he's coming at it from what I think is a very di distinctively modern position of wanting gift to at all costs not be economic 
Mm. Um, which I think is like a very distinctively modern way to think of gifts. Um, so I think mashing him up with the medievals both shows something about the medievals, but shows something about Derrida that lets you get at something like a third thing. Um, I do something similar with uh, kind of uh, uh, Giles of Lucene, who's a medieval theorist, and Gilles Deleuze. Um, uh, and specifically his stuff around money in the cinema books and his stuff around sophistry throughout his work. Because I think mm -hmm. that the medieval, the, the kind of second phase of this medieval debate is like, okay, if the user is selling you something fake, then he's somehow has to be making that look real to you. So there's something like a sophistry of money happening. And, mm -hmm. and their whole argument about it becomes this parallel of trying to root out sophistry. Like what, how do you identify the sophist? also becomes this question of how do you, how do you identify the user? Um, so I kind of bounce those two off each other. And then Agamben for the, for the Franciscan stuff, because Agamben's stuff on Franciscan use is, I think, both helpful at, he, he's, he's very good at bringing out what the Franciscans are actually doing with language mm -hmm. abuse, but he has the same limit problems as the Franciscans, which I think is interesting, which is that he makes explicit kind of the way in which this whole language revolves around minority um, and thus around kind of the legal categories of slavery. Um, but if, for anyone who's read Agamben on slavery, he, like he's awful on it. <laughs> like, uh, and in part because like for Agamben, the slave is like definitionally pre-modern. Um, like like there's, there's, it's not even that he just like ignores Atlantic slavery. It's like, it's, it's like defined away in his work in this really interesting way that I think is, is kind of symptomatic. Um, so there aren't any theoretical good guys, <laughs> I guess might be the way to put it. Um, but, I lay it out. I mean, it, uh, Deleuze might be the closest to a theoretical good guy, but even he comes out kind of critiqued. Um, uh, Derrida also comes away cleaner than Agamben does. Um, I mean, that makes that, also looking at where their politics actually ends up going by uh, one of the things about Bagambin it's like a horror movie where we now all know the ending yeah like, exactly like it's like oh this goes into the creepy place we were all afraid it was gonna go tw 10 years ago or whatever but it's now gone there but yeah I, I think I think that it doesn't surprise me that Gambin would come off looking the least good but also maybe the closest to what you're talking about because I, I do think you're right. Agamben seems to actually, you know, I I partly just think Agamben's a secular Franciscan. Like yeah, no, I think know. there's something I think there's something right about that. Like <laughs> like, like 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 he does think that the Franciscans failed. Like like mm -hmm. like he thinks like and he thinks it was a necessary failure, not an accidental one. Mm -hmm. um, but he's he thinks that their failure basically comes down to like oh, you wanted the right not to have rights and you were right not to want rights, but like the right not the right not to have rights put you in immediately the terms that you wanted to escape in a way that was could never have been overcome kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some there is a way in which he like wants what the Franciscans wanted and that's like what drives him to them. Um, and I don't think I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's that's like part of the part of the thing. Actually, I think I think the closest to a good like 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 I think the most one of the most generative theorists for me in this whole process um, is a is a, a person named Sarah Maria Sorrentino. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. So not really. That's a, not like a big name theorist. Um, but she's kind of like doing this interesting project which I found really helpful for trying to think this question of like slavery as a kind of real abstraction that isn't reducible to either like the labor, like the like abstract labor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as something that determines all these other categories in a, in a certain kind of way. Um, but so Sarah Maria's work is, uh, uh, Sarah Maria was a PhD, did her PhD um, at uh, UC Irvine under Frank Wilderson. So it comes out of that kind of Afro-pessimist milieu, but is really trying to rethink Marx's methods. Um, like, like trying to think Marx's methods um, as a way out of Marx's kind of cul-de-sac with regard to the slave. Um, mm. and, and to see, see if there is a way to kind of get 
um, something like like Marx's methodological insights, but applied to the afterlife of slavery um, as its own kind of determining abstraction that isn't reducible to the abstraction that Marx actually kind of analyzed as determining abstraction of our time. Of our time. Um, and the work is really interesting. Um, their work with Tapchi Garba is also like um, really helpful for some of this stuff. Um, so that's who I have been turning to a lot um, and who I find really useful for this. Um, not, yeah, not, not like a canonical big name, but like. But someone who's actually doing work in the field that could be useful for the specific, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also like to use theorists more as a contrast, um, yeah. uh, particularly when they think they understand uh, a time period. But again, I don't come so much out of history. Like I said, I come out of literature and anthropology. So it's, uh, which. Yeah, I mean. Sounds like the two. Theology two books, I know, yeah. even worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Fair. I mean, although it's, I have become increasingly even in the ancient world, like even in the pre-Christian world, uh, I think it's very important for contemporary thinkers to realize that theology is not blind superstition and it is not just indicative of, uh, of some kind of theoretical, it is not purely a theoretical justification for what you want. Um, right. it, it, it is a, it is kind of a theoretical grappling often with both the cultural milieu in which you exist and the world in which you see. So like you, you need to learn, like there's a lot to be learned, um, you know, and I think, well, you know, one of my things that I always talk about, like, like I, and I came to this years and years ago before I was in a Marxist where I was like, uh, there are no modern Platonists because the Platonistic theological worldview is so alien to us that we cannot adopt it. Like, yeah. The, and, and, and you even, you what I think, uh, Richard Seaford. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's right. so good. I'm showing like, yeah, I mean, you could even see the, like the, the way coinage and uh, notions of self are altering in these ancient thinkers, um, in, in a kind of key way. So this is like your, your work actually does remind me of that, but for a different time period and one that's crucial to now. Yeah, yeah. And, it's very, and it, it, like my work is very kind of inspired by the kinds of questions like Seifert was asking. Like, 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 like I kind of that, that was one of my ways into it. Also, Philip Goodchild is like the contemporary mm -hmm. person that I kind of initially got me into these questions. And then the kind of like you have these people asking the, like about the kind of theology of money now, and you have these people kind of asking about like the theology of money like at the origin or whatever. But like I kind of had this like, but what about the one? To which we are the contrast like what about the one from which we kind of mo like more directly uh the the one that we are a reaction against let's put it that way mm -hmm. <laughs> um that, that to me that's like that's kind of what drove me to the time period um yeah yeah well thank you so much sean for coming on i i learned a lot i hope my audience did too uh, would you like to plug anything before you go? Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, if I mean, so I, as, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a, a book on all of this that I'm hoping will be out um, sometime in the next year or so. In the meantime, you can go to my Twitter. I'm at Capener Sean, C-A-P-E-N-E-R Sean. Um, and uh, if, if you like want, if you're curious, my dissertation is there. Um, I know not everyone wants to read dissertations, and that's fine. Um, but that's probably the, the most up-to-date kind of document of what I'm trying to do with this as it stands. Awesome. Um, I have, I, between what I said this interview up and when we talked about it, I did not have time to read your dissertation in full, but I have skimmed it. Um, and so uh, I actually am going to look forward to sitting down with it because I, I found it very interesting and it immediately added a new wrinkle to the picture that i had of you know the transition from late medieval to early modern and um 
particularly because it makes it relevant to contemporary crises around race and debt and money today. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, if I was still a, a scholar and I'm not anymore, I would be writing a dissertation about why all the MMTers seem to really like going to early, early colonial imperial examples for everything. Yeah. Um, like, it's just like, like, I don't know, man, if you're trying to convince me that we can have a community of care based off of like what you're describing as Rhodesia, um, <laughs> like, it's, it, it, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, I think, and I think there's some questions to, to ask about, I mean, the supersession question to me is, is a question that hangs over all over that whole community of care question too, especially in terms of the source, the theoretical sources, a lot of them are interested in pulling it from. Right. Um, but that's, I think, a, a conversation for another time. Yeah, that's a whole different debate. And and yeah. one that I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want anyone to think that I'm accusing all the, uh, all the MMTers of being crypto secular trad casts or something. That I, I actually that. I want to be clear, because I think I've been perceived as accusing them of that too in the past. I, I don't actually think that about them. I, th yeah. I, I do think that they're at times, um, like accidentally taking on some some baggage that I don't think they want to take on, but I don't think it's because they're like secretly evil or like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're not like they're not secretly seed a Vaticanist trying to convert us all into like the empire of faith. No, I mean like, um, like absolutely yeah. not. But but I do think it's in I do think it's interesting when you think about the community of care language and the fact that almost all their examples are from the Catholic church, it does sort of. Yeah, and I think, I think there's some, some questions to ask. I mean, you were talking about the 15th century earlier. I think there's some questions to ask about, like some unasked questions. So so people like to talk about the Middle Ages and people like to talk about the, the line of early modernity that begins with the Bank of England and the debates around it. Mm. There's some questions to ask about Spain and Portugal <laughs> that fall in the middle there. Mm. Um, and there's some questions to ask about like Spanish and Portuguese debates about the Eus Gentium. Mm, um, from yeah. which a lot of our language around uh, like the ontological kind of priority of the relatedness of all things, um, like that plays a lot of important roles in legal debates around the East Gentium that have a lot to do with we have a <laughs> we have a, a burgeoning trade in uh, indigenous American and African slaves and how and why is that okay and like. How is it that just war is justified? Well, in part because these people claim to be cutting themselves off from that um, kind of prior relation of uh, universal dependence. Um, uh, and their denial of it is, in fact, you know, the pretext for our kind of intervention. So, like, right. there's, there's some questions to ask there that I think aren't yet being asked, but... Um, I, I am excited to see them ask. Yeah, I, I, I would. I do think that some MMT historians are up to the task, but I. Yeah, I this is not. This I, is not again. This is not me being like these. These are like evil colonial apologists. Like it, it's because they aren't that I think. Yeah, that's the more interesting thing. That I don't think they are either, and yet they keep on coming to these weird metaphors. And I'm like that. That you have to bracket something out. If you don't bracket it out then you have to ask yourself some very uncomfortable questions about what is implied by the metaphor. And and if you bracket it out, you have to ask how you can do it. Yeah, what's the justification for the bracket? Yeah. Right? Like, um, yeah. Yeah, which, which is, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's going to be the trick for them moving forward. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye.